Stay in a child's place is finally clicking as I enter into my 20-somethings. Who are you to tell me that I can't fill the margins of my notebook with gel pen nothings and trust me, they've tried. And I've cried when my mother deemed it unacceptable to turn in work that isn't my best quality. I used to stuff my math sheets in the bottom of my book bag, fill out the problems that had nothing to do with my life and put it right back. And I spent two decades trying to have it all together. Trying to go against the grain instead of dancing in bad weather and it isn't up to you whether or not my childlike behavior is appropriate or acceptable. So don't mind me if you see me and I appear a little too colorful because although you like to believe that life is simply black and white, there are far too many colors on the wheel of my dream life and the imagination of a child. Hey everybody, welcome back to Her Black Hand, the podcast where we talk about everything and everything goes. I am your host, Alexis Lawson, and I am currently wearing pink slippers, black leggings, a gray sweater with my hair in box braids with ombre goldish brown tips that is now in a blend, and I'm wearing clear glasses today and clear lip gloss. So on today's episode, Stay in a Child's Place, we are going to be talking about girlhood. We're going to be talking about what it means to be a black girl and how the experiences that we had in our childhood shaped us into these powerhouse and monumental black women. We are also going to be referencing two pieces today. We're going to be talking about a piece in Jasmine Mann's new poetry collection that comes out today, March 9th, called Black Girl Call Home. And we're also going to be referencing Jamaica Kincaid's Girl, a short story from one of her short story collections. So let's just get right into it. So if you're anything Thing like me when you were younger I always told my mom like oh my god I can't wait till I get older I can't wait to be 18 I can't wait to get off this house and I meant that with my whole entire spirit I meant all of that I wanted all the smoke I could not wait to get out of my mama house and I have to follow her rules but here I am and I'm like oh my god <laughs> adulting is so ghetto I don't know who signed us up for this I don't know who told us that like this is what we had to do all this working all these paying bills I'm just like this is adulting this is what I wanted to do. This is what I couldn't wait to do. Like, it's not even giving what you said it was going to give. It's real ghetto here. And I'm just like, I really wanted to be an adult so so quickly. Like, I wanted to grow up so fast because I thought that with being an adult came so much more to life. And it wasn't until recently that I really sat with, like, how much of a childhood that I had like how much my childhood is different from kids these days we all wanted to be so grown and I think my childhood and a lot of other people's childhood comes from our parents and I think a lot of the time especially now we are holding our parents accountable for the things that went on during our childhood and the way you are raised plays a big role in how your life goes as a child. And so in today's episode, we're definitely going to touch on the topics of mother-daughter dynamics. I grew up in a single mom household. My mom had me when she was 18 years old. So there were a lot of things that my friends experienced that I didn't get the opportunity to experience in such manner of having grown up in a two person household. So the first piece that I want to talk about is a piece from Jasmine Mann's book, Black Girl Call Home. I saw this piece a couple months back as she was promoting her book and it really made me stop what I was doing and really think about what this piece says. So it says, tell me about the girl my mother was before she traded in all of her girl to become my mother. And it really made me sit with the fact that as children, we put our parents on pedestals. We make them these godlike figures in our lives that because they seem to have such an important role in our lives, not realizing that our parents are equally as human as we are. And we have so many expectations of what our parents should do and how our parents should treat us. And it really clouds the being of who they are. And I didn't really get to sit with that and think about that until after I left my mother's house and then I got to realize how regular my mother was how much of a person my mother was because my whole life she had always just been that's my mom oh that's my mom like she's not a person she's my mom not knowing not acknowledging that before me she had her own life she has her own interests she has her own dislikes and I always took into consideration and acknowledged the fact that my mom did have me at 18 and that's a common narrative in the black community my mom had me at 18 so she gave up 
her childhood to raise another child. Yes, it was her decision, but not everybody steps up to the plate of raising a child, especially when they are still a child. So my mom had to grow up faster than a lot of people around her and a lot of her friends. And so not only because she had a child, but because she knew that she didn't want her child to go through the same things that she went through in her own childhood. So my mother was born into a household with a lot of brothers and sisters. So being the oldest girl, she was given a lot of responsibility to look after and take care of kids who were not hers. And I think that that transferred into how she parented me and my brother. When my brother was born, I was nine years old. Well, eight years old, going on nine years old. And I didn't necessarily like the idea of getting another sibling. I had been fine on by my own. I was self-sufficient. And that is so much different from how my brother is now. I feel like a lot of the time in my childhood, I had to like take care of him. I had to be this like figure for him and help out. And I just didn't understand why I had to help out so much when I didn't make this baby. And it, he was not my child. So in that aspect, I realized that like, not only did I have to grow up faster in that sense, there were a lot of other expectations of me when I was a young girl that I didn't necessarily have to have. And so I realized that my mom probably didn't know any better because all her life she was taking care of somebody else's child as well. She was always the person that people go to. And even now to this day, she's the person that people depend on and rely on to handle their business. So that was kind of like second nature to just like delegate and say, here, you do this. You help me with this, not really acknowledging how that was going to affect me. And in addition to also having to play as a role of a second parent because his father wasn't in the picture my father wasn't in the picture and it was really just me and my mom and my brother was really young we all moved to North Carolina so it really was just the three of us and so those long summers when we first moved here when my mom was just working 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 I didn't have any friends because I could never leave the house or join anything because I had to stay at home and watch Taj my brother and so there are a lot of things that I didn't really grasp until I became an adult and really sat down and saw my mother as a woman instead of my mother. And I didn't realize that my mom did have me at 18. So she was growing the same way that I'm growing now at 20. There are lessons that she had to learn while also trying to teach me them. So sometimes I did get the short end of the stick, but it's not because she intentionally wanted to give me the short end of the stick. It's because she was learning and healing and going through things the same times that she was trying to teach me those same lessons. And so to my next point, I want to talk about all the implied expectations of what it means to be a woman and more specifically what it means to be a mother. Because society has concocted this image of what a woman is supposed to be. She's supposed to look a certain way. She's supposed to be this oh so feminine figure. She's supposed to be quiet and only speak when spoken to. She's supposed to be strong, but also soft and be able to bear the weight of the world on her shoulders. And that is just so unrealistic. It's so unrealistic that we have those expectations put onto us and it's so unrealistic and crazy that we actually try and meet those standards. And so let's just take a moment to think back to our childhood and think about all the things that we were told as women or as girls not to do. How about don't wear those short shorts in the house, there's men here. Or you're not allowed to wear red nail polish, that's for hoochies or heifers as my grandma used to say. Or what about straight hair, bone straight hair is for grown-ups. Or don't wear that or don't act that way because you're being fast. There's so many expectations that are embedded in us from the moment that we are conceived that we don't realize how the big of a part that plays into how we behave and how we function when we become women. And that is so important to think about, which leads me into the next story that I want to talk about, Girl by Jamaica Kincaid. So this story was published in 1978 in The New Yorker, and I love this story. It is so real. It is so raw. It is crazy how relevant it is, and it's 2021, and this was published in 1978. So let's just talk about it. Girl, to me, is about a mother and a daughter relationship and her preparing her for the world of womanhood and adulthood and what she needs to know to be a fully functioning woman and one line that stands out to me in this story is Sundays try to walk like a lady and not the slut you're so hell-bent on becoming 
So let's think how many times our aunties or our mothers or our grandmas told us that like what we wear is too fast or too grown or we're acting too grown and we need to act our age. Why is it that we hypersexualize young girls? Why is it that we take away their innocence and we take away their fun by placing these expectations and stereotypes on them before they even know who they are themselves? And also, why are we so comfortable with doing it? Why are we so comfortable making them hyper aware of themselves before they are even before they even get a chance to be comfortable with who they are, before they even get a chance to experience things outside of what they know? You've already told them who they can and cannot be. And so in the next part of the story, it says, this is how you behave in the presence of men who don't know you very well. And that way they won't recognize the slut I've warned you against becoming. So let's just set it up. She's already set it up that women, her daughter has to act a certain way for the appeal of a man. We're always taught that we have to behave. Women have to behave. We have to be ladylike. We have to be respectful. We have to look a certain way. We have to carry ourselves a certain way to be worthy of respect or worthy of the attention of a man and from a young age we are already setting those standards and those expectations of how to behave to get the attention of a man why do we put men on these pedestals and give them these unseen power over our lives why is so much of the things that we do dedicated to the response of a man And so in this, I see that we're teaching girls from a young age that they have to act a certain way around men and that everything that they do and every move they make is dependent on the reaction and response of men. So how do we fix our mouths to reprimand young girls, calling them fast when they're not doing anything other than what they're seeing us doing or seeing the women that they're looking at doing? So if she sees you not speaking up for yourself, then she isn't going to speak up for herself. If she sees you dressing a certain way while you're entertaining company or going out to see a man, then she's going to think that that's how she has to behave. So how do we judge or how do we place these expectations and rules and guidelines on these little bitty children when they're not doing anything but mirroring the things that we're doing. And so that makes me think about me and my mom. Me and my mom never looked like my mom's light bright. I'm brown chocolate. And my mom always wore her hair short. I always wore my hair long. She was more of like a black and white business. And I was more like a punky Brewster all over the place type of fashion. But I remember one thing that my mom did when I was younger that I really wanted to do. And I could never ever do but the moment that I got some jurisdiction over my life it was probably the first thing that I did when my mom was when I was younger my mom used to wear red nails and right now it doesn't seem like a big thing but to me I always wanted to wear red nails I love red nails I love red lipstick and my mom always wore that and I was never allowed to wear it you want to know the reason why because her grandmother told her that red nails are for hussies How is a color on a nail dedicated in contributing to the character of a person or the things that they do? Maybe my favorite color is red and I just wanted to have red on my nails, but I never got to experience that because you had already told me that red nails are for people who you believe don't respect themselves or you believe carry them with carry themselves a way that I should never carry myself so I was never allowed to wear nails and I really never understood it and still now I don't understand why that was such a big thing. But I guess it's also how when we wanted our hair straight, we could never get our hair straight without getting our ends bumped. Because somebody had told them that your bone straight hair was too grown and we had to bump the ends to give it some childlike character. It's the same thing. And I, like... We have to think about where all of these things come from. Their mothers told them. Their grandmothers told them. It's just generations and generations of expectations and rules and guidelines passed down that really cripple the generations coming after not letting them express themselves freely and fully develop into the person that they could have became. Do you ever wonder about the person you could have became if nobody gave you the rules and told you who you couldn't be? I always think about that. I always wonder how I would have turned out if I didn't have so many rules, if I didn't grow up in such a strict household, if I could hang out with my friends when I wanted to, or if I could spend the night at my friend's house when I wanted to, or if I could just be the be the kid who 
didn't have so many rules and didn't have so many expectations and didn't have so many things placed on them that they didn't really need or that they couldn't really hold and also that they didn't have the words to express. They already see us as these overly emotional beings and for me my form of release is to cry i'ma cry i got a long day i'ma cry if things ain't going my way i'ma cry if the words ain't coming i'ma cry and so going back to what i said earlier about how there are certain things i wish i would have gotten a lesson about before i had to experience it i really wish somebody would have sat me down and taught me how to communicate how to talk about how i am feeling that would have saved me so many tears so many nights of just being angry of not being able to speak my peace it would have just saved me so much but I never got the chance to express how I felt or even have my input on things that involved my life because I need to stay in a child's place I need to watch who I'm talking to and I don't think adults and I don't think our parents realize how hurtful those couple terms were in our lives to tell us to stay in our place when we're trying to express how I feel. How is my feelings not my place when it's revolving me? When will we see that respect is not something that children should have to gain from their parents, but something that should already be freely given because we're both humans. We're both people. The same way my mother was once a girl like me, I am going to be a woman like her. So does that level of respect not come until I'm an adult or come until I'm the woman that she expects me to be or that she feels comfortable enough giving me that respect? No, it should start when she's a child. It should start giving her that power in her voice before anybody else can take it away from her. I've always been an advocate for children being able to find their voice in their home first and being able to speak outside of it. How do you expect them to be able to communicate and do these grand things if they're not taught the skills of communication and able to actively practice in the home with people that they are most comfortable about? It just doesn't make any sense. So the next line that I want to talk about in this story, it says, this is how to love a man. If this doesn't work, there are other ways. And we're going to stop there because I want to talk about there are other ways. When I read that, my mind instantly went to sex. I don't know how many times me, my friends, people that I've talked to have tried to fix things with sex. And so we grow up thinking that sex is just this monumental thing. And so we rushed to experience it and we realized that like it was so underwhelming. And so when we get older and we get in these relationships, we try and fix things with sex, thinking it's going to be the all in all, because that's when we're, quote unquote, supposed to feel the most closest. So that's instantly what I thought about. And so let me finish the line. And it says, if they don't work, don't feel too bad about giving up. That really stuck with me because one thing about being in a black household, you are probably not allowed to date. Boys should be the last thing on your mind, but they expect us to be able to hold these adult relationships and be successful in these adult relationships when we weren't taught the foundations of what these relationships require and in addition to that they always tell you to love somebody like love is all we have love is the strongest thing that a person can experience but one thing they never taught us and one thing they never teach us is how to stop loving I think I really like the end of this line where it says don't feel too bad about giving up because sometimes in a relationship that we given our all to or that we spent a lot of our time with it's like dang if I give up what did I do all this work for if I give up I'm failing and I think that In my younger years of experience in dating and relationships, I tried to give myself too much. I gave too much of myself and didn't get a lot in return. And when it was time to walk away, I was hesitant because I had felt like I put so much into this relationship. How could I just walk away? I wish somebody would have taught me that it's okay to walk away and it's okay to not be okay while walking away, but it is going to get better because there's so many times where I should have walked away and left people's sons alone, but I held on trying to hope that they would get better, hope that they would change for me not realizing that people only change when it is beneficial to them and so this line of not feeling bad when giving up is like dang I wish somebody would have told me don't feel bad if it don't work out and I think if a lot of people had this mentality while dating and while experiencing these emotions that it's okay to give up it's okay if it doesn't work out I think those are words that we need to hear 
And so if we don't hear those words, if we've never been taught that like it's okay if things don't work out, but we've been constantly pressed and praised when things do work out, we're going to hold that into every aspect of our lives. And I just thought that was really interesting because usually we see our love and we get our idea of love from our parents, but I had never seen that in my life. So my idea of love was just like what I had seen in movies or what I had read in books. And like, we all know that that's not a realistic vision of what love is and what real love is like, because love isn't scripted. Life isn't scripted. There are things that happen that we can't control and so as a child my idea of love was very romanticized and even now as an adult I still have these moments of where I want my love life to be like a romantic movie and I have to sit with myself sometimes and realize like that's not reality that will never happen though those moments may happen in somebody's lives I can't depend on my idea of love to be like that And so the last thing that I want to talk about is connecting with childlike things as an adult and tapping into our inner child. And I think one thing that has really helped me in this area of my life is working in this elementary school this last year. They have really helped me realize how serious I am all the time. And I really think it's because as I was a child, I was always do your schoolwork, go to practice, do your schoolwork, go practice. And my mom will always say, you only got two things to do. Keep your room clean and get good grades. Keep your room clean and get good grades. And so that really transferred into my adult life because I am so serious. I'm always focused on my next career move that I seldomly have fun. I don't even know how to have fun. Like I am not that friend. I am the friend that goes out, but I'm like very reserved. And I'm just like, I wish I was the person that was like, oh my God, here's the moves for this weekend. And we're going to do this. I wish I was that person. I don't know how to be that person, but working in this job has really taught me how to just laugh at some things and just be present in the moment. Like I have just been living for the stories that my children write, the stories that they come in and tell me. And it really sits with me that these little girls that I'm teaching are clinging to me. It really makes me wonder, like, how did I manage to become the woman that I always wanted to be? looking at the women on TV that I aspire to be or looking at my aunts or looking at my mom. How did I become this woman that is Alexis Lawson? And I realized that I have all these little girls looking up to me. And I'm just like, I am the person that I used to look up to. How did I randomly one day wake up and become that person? And it helped me realize and it helps me stay focused and grounded. Like all the things that I'm doing, I really have to stay on my P's and Q's because there's a little girl looking at me. There's a little girl taking in all of the words that I'm saying to her. And every little thing that I say and every little thing that I do may not seem monumental in that moment, but I have no clue how it's going to affect them 10 years down the road. I know have no clue how much of an influence, how much of an impact that I'm being to them. And I think that is so crazy. And one thing that one of my students told me is that like, I don't have to have it all together. They was like, yeah, you're 20. You don't have to have it all together because like you're the same age as my brother. And I realized that I often put a lot of pressure on myself because although I do have these degrees and I'm out of college and I've been out of college for a year and other people who are my age are still in college and not having to worry about the same things that I'm worrying about I still do have that grace with myself they're like hey you are 20 you don't have to have it all together you don't have to be right all the time you still have room to make mistakes you're gonna make mistakes for the rest of your lives and these kids telling me giving me permission to just relax and breathe and just be and not be so serious with myself and not be so serious with them has really benefited me and it's always like kids are the best teachers kids are the best judge of character kids give us what we forget to give ourselves and they really have taught me that and they have just made me want to just dream bigger. I think about all the things that they talk about, all the things that they desire, and I'm just like, I used to want those things too. What time in my life did I stop wanting those things? What time in my life did I stop dreaming as big as I used to and concealed everything into this one pinpoint specific dream? When did that become me? 
the girl who doodled in her margins, the girl who daydreamed in the middle of math class and couldn't pass a math test for her whole life, the girl who could tell you a story off the top of her head. Where did that where did that girl go? And so in working in this elementary school, I have been really subconsciously gearing a lot of my writing towards like focusing on childhood and aspects of my childhood that I have forgotten that I just randomly remember. And they have really sat with me and taught me a lot about being a child. Why does being a child and being an adult have to be two separate worlds and why can't they be one? Because really, we never grow up. We just get bigger and the flames of dreams that we have just simply die out. When did our dreams become less important? Does the dream become smaller as we get older? Are they not as important as they were when we were five? or 10, or 18, or 20? Is the dream still not important? Is our wants and desires still not important? Why do when when we get older and why, when we get more deep into this adulting life, because, you know, we're really just big-ass children, why do we settle in the things that we have if we want more? Because one thing I know, if my child want to do something, if one of my students want to do something, they do it. They don't ask me permission. They don't ask for my help. They just do it. And I think that's one thing that I have learned from them to just do it. Stop waiting for somebody to do it with you. Stop waiting for somebody to tell you it's okay. Stop waiting for somebody to give you the answer. And Because so, sometimes you're just going to have to fail. Sometimes you're just going to have to mess up to see how it really feels to do the things that you want to do. And that's one thing that they have really taught me because they're just like yeah I don't care I may get a whooping for it but I'm gonna do it anyways like I enjoyed it while I did it and I'm like bro that's some stuff I would have said that is literally something that I would have said when I was like their age like I'm gonna do it anyway I'm gonna get in trouble for it anyway so I might as well do it and then get in trouble because I'm gonna enjoy it while I'm doing it like and I really I really feel that and so like I just be vibing with my kids because they are really the homies like, I want friends with their heart and their courage and their spirit 20 years old. I wish that adults possess the courage and spunk of children. I wish that we weren't put in situations and told that we couldn't do those things that they died out. I wish we weren't in those positions. I wish that we had the dreams that children have because you can't tell a child that they can't be what they want to be. A child is going to do everything that it's destined to do until it's put in a box and told it can't. And I think that's so crazy how we were once them, but we act like we've never been their age, never had their struggles, never had their thoughts when we were literally just there. And if we close our eyes tight enough and try to remember, we can literally go back to the age of our grandchildren or the age of our friend's child or the age of our newborn. We can go back and see that we were once them. Because who were you before you traded in your girlhood to become the woman that you are? Who were you? What did you like to do? What did you enjoy? Who did you talk to? What was your favorite color? Who were you before Society forced us into this role that we have no guidelines on how to be. Who are you? And that's the question I want to leave y'all with. Who were you before you traded in your girl to become a woman? Who are you? So that is it for today's episode of Stay in a Child's Place. I hope that I have left you wondering about the girl you traded in to become a woman or the boy you traded in to become a man because there is so much in our childhood years that we often forget as we grow older or we often don't pay attention to the effects of the things that happened when we were children and how they are influencing our day-to-day lives right now. And if I could just leave you with one more question before we end this episode, I just want you to think if... Your childhood you saw you today, would they be proud of you? Would they be proud of the actions that you're making? Would they be proud of the dreams you're chasing? And if your answer is yes, then great. But if your answer is no, really sit back and think about what the child you wanted, what the child you dreamed about, or even how the child you dreamed. How did your dreams change? How did your wants and desires change? And how have you grown from the things that you wanted as a child? 
Thank y'all so much for tuning in to today's episode. Don't forget to check out Jasmine Mann's Black Girl Call Home and Jamaica Kincaid's Girl. Both will be linked in the description box below. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Her Black Hand to keep up with updates about the podcast and more of my writing. So I guess that's it for this one and I'll catch y'all in my next one. Peace.